Good evening and greetings, everybody. I'm Leela McDowell. I'm a vice president with the Eisenhower Foundation. I'm also an on-air radio personality and entertainment reporter and reporter with iHeartRadio and the black-owned EURweb.com. So we are really excited to have this panel with us today for a very important conversation. And this, we are looking at 50 years after the Kerner Commission, can art inspire the new will to reduce racial inequality, racial injustice, and poverty? We want to extend a gratitude. We want to extend our thanks and gratitude to the Mellon Foundation for supporting this initiative and really express our profound gratitude to all of our esteemed panelists who are joining us this evening. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share brief bios of everyone, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Alan Curtis. Alan is the president and the founding president and the CEO of the Eisenhower Foundation. He also served as an appointee the administrations of Presidents Jimmy Carter and Lyndon Baines Johnson. He's a social scientist, he's a public policy advisor, he's an evaluator, a designer of inner city ventures that develop human capital. He's an author and a speaker. So let me go through just in alphabetical order all of these the panelists that we have with us today. And again, thank you so much for joining us. We are honored, honored by your presence. So Rasu Jelani is a social sculptor and cultural producer who investigates the intersection of art, culture, civic engagement, and innovation. He's a board member of the Laundromat Project. It's a project that I absolutely love. It's a visionary organization that advances artists and neighbors as change agents in their own community. Pamela Joyner, who is joining us as well, has nearly 30 years. I know she doesn't look like she could be that old, but she has nearly 30 years of experience in the investment industry. She's the founder of Avid Partners LLC, and right now she's focusing a lot on her philanthropic work, and we thank you for that, in the arts and education. She's a trustee of the Art Institute of Chicago, of the J. Paul Getty Trust, San Francisco MoMA, and the Museum of Modern Art. She also served as a member of President Obama's Committee on the Arts and Humanities. Glenn D. Lowry, is the director of the Museum of Modern Art since 1995. He's shepherded the museum's legacy of enriching public life through exhibitions, educational programs, publications, and digital tools that challenge conventional ideas about modern and contemporary art and design. And we hope to be doing some challenging this evening in our conversation. He lectures and writes in support of contemporary art and on the role of museums in society, among other topics. And he also serves as a member of the Mellon Foundation's Board of Trustees, as well as many other organizations. And just a little bit of trivia about Glenn. In 2004, the French government honored him with the title of Officier dans l'ordre des arts et des lettres. So congratulations on that. And if you have not seen Critical Fabulations, an exhibit at MoMA, I urge you to go and see it. It's amazing. And just for me personally, that Jackson Pollock always feeds my soul when I go in there. It's been there for years, and it's, it's like my mini church. Matthew Teitelbaum, director of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston since 2015. Under his leadership, the 150-year-old museum has introduced new initiatives, programs, and partnerships to invite, welcome, and engage diverse audiences and build a more inclusive community of visitors, staff, volunteers, and supporters with a very special focus on some notable exhibitions presenting new curatorial scholarship and incorporate the perspectives of and expertise of diverse voices with timely issues. Right, some of the notable exhibitions, Writing the Future, Basquiat and the Hip Hop Generation, amazing exhibit, and Black History's Black Futures come to mind. Nicola Vassell is an art dealer, 
author and principal at Nicola Vassell Gallery. Very important that you go visit it. Amazing works are on display there. Prior to the gallery, she founded Concept NV, a curatorial agency that is dedicated to exhibitions and discourse on cultural phenomena. Daniel Weiss is the president and CEO of the Met since 2017, a scholar of art history and a season leader of complex institutions. He has served as a professor, president, department chair in several colleges and universities. He's the author of six books and he has published and lectured widely on a variety of topics as diverse as the art of middle ages and crusades higher education, museums, and American culture. Before uh, Yesterday We Could Fly is a really important and compelling exhibit. It is gripping. Again, Before Yesterday We Could Fly, an Afrofuturist period is, a, is very powerful to see. And of course, I'm still waiting for my Met Gala invitation. I don't have the Tax the Rich gown yet, but I can work on it. <laughs> And Hank Willis Thomas, uh, and thank you so much, Hank, for that evocative uh, piece that we were able to put on the invitation, Crossroads 2012, which you did in collaboration with Sanford Biggers, and we utilized that on the flyer. He is a conceptual artist, working primarily with themes related to perspective, identity, commodity, media, and popular culture. His compelling work has been exhibited throughout the United States and abroad, including at the Guggenheim Museum, the Studio Museum of Harlem, the Corcoran Gallery of Art, the Whitney Museum, and many more. He's also the recipient of numerous fellowships, including the Guggenheim and Soros Equality Fellowship, and he serves as a member of the New York City Public Design Commission. So thank you all so much again. We are just honored that you are here. We've got a lot to cover this evening, so let's just dive in. Let's start with Alan Curtis. Thank you, Mila. Uh, thank you, Tracy Felder. Thank you so much to our distinguished panelists. It's an hour and a half uh, at the end of a busy day, and thank you to the Mellon Foundation for its support. I'm gonna provide a 10-minute uh, overview uh, and then we'll get into uh, the, the questions that we'd like to dialogue with you on. Um, at the Smithsonian, uh, the uh, National Museum of American History, African American History and Culture's uh, current exhibition uh, titled Reckoning, Protest, Defiance, Resilience, features a portrait of Breonna Taylor done posthumously by uh, Amy. Charal, who of course uh, painted the official portrait of uh, Michelle Obama. The Breonna Taylor painting is a powerful, elegant, and psychologically direct statement on reckoning in America. And it's about Black Lives Matter and 2020 and George Floyd. The painting, painting's meaning uh, carries America back as well, we believe, to the disturbances of the 1960s Detroit and New York and Chicago, Washington, 150 other cities across the country. In response to the 60s uh, protests, President Lyndon Johnson formed a bipartisan National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders. It was called the uh, Kerner Commission in short uh, after its chair, who was the then governor of, uh, of Illinois. Most of the members of the Kerner Commission were privileged white men who bore the imprimatur of the political establishment. Nonetheless, a majority of the Kerner Commissioners concluded in 1968 that the underlying cause of the protest was white racism, quote unquote. The commission advised in its conclusions, it is time to make good the promises of American democracy to all citizens, urban and rural, black and white, Spanish surname, American Indian, and every minority group, quote. Today, it is still time to make good the promises of democracy to all Americans. In healing our divided society, the Eisenhower Foundation's 50-year update of the current commission, we recently concluded that America has made uh, little progress in reducing racial injustice 
economic inequality and poverty. In many ways, we have gone backwards. Since the Kerner Commission, deep poverty, income inequality, wealth inequality, public school segregation, and mass incarceration of people of color have increased. White nationalist movements have strengthened, as we saw in Charlottesville. The Capitol building in Washington was invaded on January 6th. The pandemic has made things disproportionately worse for people of color and for the truly disadvantaged. Nonetheless, over the last 50 years, the nation has built up considerable evidence on policies that work. Keynesian living wage investments and childcare for average citizens work. The Affordable Health Care Act and vaccination work. Head Start and equity in public school finance work. Community-based crime prevention by grassroots nonprofit organizations assisted by carefully trained police work. Housing mobility models work and can lead to school integration. Yet as we have talked with people around the nation on Kerner and healing priorities, we have found that the public does not, for the most part, understand that we know a lot about what works and that policy needs to be based on facts, on evidence, on science, not on statistical ignorance, dogma, and supposition. We also have learned a great deal about what doesn't work, like zero tolerance policing, mass incarceration of people of color, and willful indifference to the unequal distribution of prosperity. Most of all, what doesn't work, I suggest, includes false 1980s trickle-down rhetoric on government being the problem. Now, with the pandemic having made everything disproportionately worse for people of color and impoverished Americans, we need to continue advocating for a more activist public sector that recognizes healing and current priorities. It is time, we suggest, to seize the day to renegotiate the social contract, to restructure basic power equations, and to change the rules of the game. The goal is not to get back to normal. Normal has been the problem in America. We have in fact already reversed that false 1980s rhetoric on government. 2020 hosted the largest expansion of federal financial activity in American history. And with the infrastructure legislation just passed, the momentum continues in 2021. Yet in order to seize the day, to scale up what works and to scale down what doesn't work, we still need what the Turner Commission called new will from the American people. What is the use of evidence in our threatened democracy if there is no will to take action? How then can we create new will in our divided society? That is one of the most important questions of our time. New will can be created through the voting rights legislation being proposed in Congress by the infrastructure legislation just passed and by the education, family, and child anti-poverty legislation that is now being debated. Some also say that <clears throat> generating new will can in part be a function of the humanities, the visual arts, the performing arts, museums, and higher learning institutions. And that is our theme this evening. Martin Luther King, Dolores Huerta, John Lewis, and Cesar Chavez created cultural change in the 1960s, change that was <clears throat> facilitated, visualized, and amplified by museums and other cultural institutions, by the visual arts and by the performing arts. <clears throat> that cultural change helped influence public sector legislation, like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And in turn, that legislation <clears throat> created more cultural change and more legislation. Culture impacts policy and policy impacts culture. To better define how culture can impact policy, we are collaborating on panels with visionaries in the arts and the humanities like tonight's distinguished panel. Some of our other panels have included or will include Sarah Lewis, Mel Chin, Reginald Dwayne Betts, Troy Harjo, Elizabeth Hinton, Tracy Smith, and William Barber. Bishop Barber reminded us that the sanity of any movement is contingent upon the strength of its song. Sometimes he said, 
the pain is so great, you need to begin with music and tonight with art. After all our panels, we will report back to the Millen Foundation on lessons learned and action needed. What then are we asking of our panels? Most importantly, we are asking whether there can be an organized cause and effect strategy in which the visual arts, museums, and the performing arts better visualize, amplify, and facilitate Turner and healing priorities. Can this be done in a way to create measurable change in America that generates new will? And can that new will then lead to measurable reductions in racial injustice, economic inequality, and poverty? Those are, that's our lead question. And during all of these panels, we are asking for examples of success, illustrations of how the arts positively impact policy. But we are also pushing the envelope for more, for how systemically the arts can do better in the future, and for how we can document positive cause and effect outcomes. For fact, perhaps we are asking for too much. I'm, I'm still not sure yet, but we want to try. To help frame tonight's convening, I want to briefly share uh, an event uh, we recently un undertook uh, on C-SPAN with the directors of the Smithsonian African American, Latinx, Native American, Asian Pacific, American History and Women's Museums. Uh, some of the Smithsonian directors were people of color, most of them actually, uh, we asked them uh, whether they thought it was important for leading art and cultural institutions uh, to seize the day, as we have argued in Healing Our Divided Society. We asked them about the current Smithsonian Breonna Taylor exhibition on racial reckoning. We inquired whether young people from the South Bronx, the South Side of Chicago, and South Central LA would come to see the exhibition. Most, of course, uh, will not make the trip to the Smithsonian in DC. We asked the Smithsonian directors, does this mean the Breonna Taylor uh, portrait and the exhibition must be more creatively projected on the Smithsonian website? And what is the role of our deeply imperfect social media that generates so much division in our nation? We asked whether the Smithsonian needs to focus on how local galleries, smaller museums, and individual artists across the nation can create new will as, as well as uh, the large and prestigious cultural museums. We asked the Smithsonian directors, do uh, we expand the Art for Justice Fund strategy in which the arts are used to inspire collaborative grassroots organizing by nonprofit groups to reduce uh, racial injustice and economic inequality? and to further the Poor People's Campaign created by Dr. King and continued by Bishop Barber. We asked whether foundations like Mellon and Ford need to further expand fellowships for artists of color. Just as Dr. King was assembling a coalition among all races and most classes before he was assassinated in 1968, we asked the Smithsonian directors about the need to communicate to multiple audiences. So for example, we think uh, we need to communicate to believers, of course, uh, how to better visualize Kerner and healing priorities to help motivate them to continue the movement. But importantly, we also need to communicate to independents and undecided people, as well as to Americans who may be opposed to Kerner, Kerner and healing priorities, like some whites living in poverty, and like the state legislators who have passed voter suppression laws. In response to our questions, the Smithsonian directors felt it was important for prestigious national cultural uh, institutions to spend considerable resources to seize the day and generate new, new will. They said, we have no choice but to be active, to be engaged. This Smithsonian position is significant, I think, because, for example, some of our audiences uh, some of the people in our audience at uh, our, our recent uh, panel at the National Humanities Conference questioned whether national institutions are capable of seizing the day. And because unlike uh, MoMA, the Met, and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, some prestigious art museums has, have so far declined events like our convening tonight. Our Smithsonian uh, 
One, one Smithsonian director invoked Dr. King's iconic 1963 letter from Birmingham jail in which he wrote that more than slow and incremental change is needed. Dr. King eloquently argued that whereas the ill will of rabid segregationists was out in the open and therefore could be combated uh, in the 60s, the shallow understanding of mildly supportive people threatened to reinforce acceptance of the comfortable status quo. Another Smithsonian director pointed to how Dr. King's Poor People's March on Washington in 1968 seized the day and included a diversity of poor African-American, uh, Latinos, Americans, uh, Native Americans, and whites demanding an economic bill of rights that addressed not only racial injustice, but also economic inequality. The Smithsonian director stressed the need today for multicultural alliances of all races and most classes and walks of life. So we did not have time to discuss with them how to engage people opposed to Kerner and healing priorities. The Smithsonian directors discussed whether it was possible to create an American story that was unifying across the experiences of the different races represented by the Smithsonian Museums. They felt America cannot create a shared future without a shared past. And the Smithsonian directors pointed out that there are more local museums than Starbucks and McDonald's across America. They underscored the need to strengthen and energize local grassroots and neighborhood focused museums and other art institutions to create new will. Although our Smithsonian event used the Breonna Taylor exhibition as a model for the future, the present MoMA uh, Adam Pendleton exhibition also powerfully, I believe, addresses the contemporary period of intense questioning by artists, by audiences, questioning of the allegiances, programming, and practices of museums. Tonight, then, I look forward to how we can advance such questioning. We ask our panelists tonight, do you believe MoMA, the Met, and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston should take a position similar to the Smithsonian? Can MoMA, the Met, and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and other prestigious art museums, in fact, better create change and new will that results in less racial injustice and less economic inequality? How can independent artists, gallery owners of color, and grassroots art organizations better engage in the creation of new will? And finally, how can new will be generated among a diversity of audiences? For all of those audiences, the message remains the same. The message remains the dream deferred. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Perhaps that dream just sags like a heavy load or does it just explode? And of course that poem was the poem of the iconic black poet Langston Hughes, a dream deferred, you know, what happens to a dream deferred. So why don't we just dive right in your thoughts on what the Smithsonian was saying? I mean, do you think that MoMA and the Met and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston should take a similar position that was outlined by the Smithsonian in the presentation we just heard. And we can just go, you know, alphabetical order. So we'll start with you, Pam. Uh, so I am uh, very optimistic about um, the role that all three of these museums are playing and have the potential to play. I am not at all discouraged by this moment in time. Um, I have a, a Jack Whitten painting uh, on the screen behind me that is called Homage to Muhammad Ali. And so I'm uh, contemplating the 1960s moment uh, in the art world compared to today's moment. And that's the place from which I take my enthusiasm. Because in the 60s, there was a sense of real unrest 
and museums trying to reckon uh, with their um, uh, inclusiveness and uh, their relationship to equity. And uh, there were efforts made that didn't come to fruition, but we're in a different time and day now. So what's the manifestation? Um, you know, uh, I see uh, institutions like the MoMA telling a true history, a fulsome history and a more inclusive history. And so I must say one of the most moving moments I can remember having in recent history uh, is walking into the MoMA galleries and seeing Faith Ringgold's die juxtaposed with Demoiselle, uh, because that's certainly a great place of honor. And just the signaling that makes to a diverse community says, you have a right to be here, you have a place in this space, uh, and this is what you can aspire to. And so as an activist collector interested in helping to rewrite history, helping um, organizations to tell a long-term sustainable true history, I'm one that's very encouraged. Now we can't hear you. I said, thank you so much, Pam, and let's get some thoughts from Glenn. Thanks, Leila. And first of all, uh, it's great to be here with all of you. Uh, Nicola, I really admire the program you're developing in your gallery. Hank knows that I'm a huge fan of his, have been for a long time. Matthew is one of my oldest and closest friends, and Dan Weiss has done an extraordinary job stewarding the Met through an incredibly difficult period and a newer friend. And Pamela, you are a trustee, collector, and colleague par excellence. So it, it feels great to be with you in, 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 in this moment. Uh, behind me is another Jack Whitten painting, uh, homage a Edouard Glisson. Edward Glisson was a Caribbean poet, critic, uh, activist, who promoted the idea of negritude, the notion that it was possible to be free of all colonial influences and shackles. And uh, Jack Whitten thought long and hard, uh, a topolis, uh, the, 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 the nature of this painting of a place of where no one is from any one place, where you gather together cultures from different moments and bring them together free of those structures that had in a way um, affected and defined them so that they can create their own culture, a new culture. Uh, and I believe that we are in one of those potentially transformative moments where we are refining and redefining culture in America. But I am not as optimistic as Pamela is. I'm, a, uh, I'm optimistic that our institutions on an individual basis can grapple with their own histories and affect change, even systemic change within those institutions. But does art have the power to tackle the kind of um, aspirations that Alan laid out? Do museums have the power to create this new will where there's a cause and effect that is measurable I, I very much doubt that. I think what we can be are our catalysts, what we can be our crucibles, what we can be are places that encourage and even um, define new and different histories. And the work that we've done at the Museum of Modern Art, motivated in large part by some of the thinking that Hank has shared with us over the years, has been just that, to really think hard about how we can be more representative of the richness and complexity of culture, not just in this country, but around the world, how we can present that to a public that can engage with that and think about it. But are we the actual agent of change? That's instrumentalizing museums in a way that I don't think um, is ultimately possible or even productive. What I think we can do is model what we believe to be best practices in terms of how we collect, what we collect, how we display, uh, and how we engage our publics. And if we do that well, uh, 
we can create the opportunity for people to engage with new issues and new ideas. Uh, and I'm very optimistic about the ways in which all of our institutions have tried to go about this. I, I think at the moment, uh, with pride uh, at Adam Pendleton's Who is Queen, an extraordinary installation in our atrium that addresses recent issues, not just in Black history, but in queer history, and invites us to think differently about highly charged topics. I think of Pepa Nosorio's installation, Badge of Honor, which addresses problems of mass incarceration, where there are communities in New Jersey where having an incarcerated uh, family member is actually a badge of honor. Uh, and what does that mean to those communities that have been devastated that way? We can invite people to think about that, but we cannot cause them to think differently. That's not in our purview, I don't believe. Uh, and I've spent the last year and a half, as everybody on this call has, thinking hard about how do we address these profoundly troubling problems of race and equity in our country. Uh, and I worry that for all of the energy of the moment, for all of the commitment everyone on this uh, panel has, for all of the commitment everyone outside of this panel may have, we don't have a good record in this country of sustaining that conversation and of sustaining that change. And I think that's the challenge before all of us. How do we ensure that these issues carry forward after the energy of the current moment wanes as it almost inevitably will wane when a new crisis, a new set of issues presents itself. So that's where my anxiety lies. Thank you so much, Glenn. And now as we're moving alphabetically, Matthew, would you like to share some wisdom with us? I always like to follow Glenn when he talks about his anxiety. You know, it sort of gets me <laughs> uh, We share anxieties. You know, I was thinking about the questions that Alan uh, had posed in his remarks. Uh, thinking very much about how museums make meaning and share meaning. Um, and maybe the thing I could, I could share here is the divide I feel uh, with some of our younger staff. Uh, because I do think we're at a moment of generational shift. Um, I, I don't think museums by nature, and in this I'm aligned with what Glenn had just said, are activists by nature. And I don't think they are social justice organizations. Uh, I don't think by nature or by DNA is a museum activist or a social justice organization uh, because museums are about continuum. They're about legacy and continu continuity. We can question it, we can play with it, we can mold it, we can create new trajectories, but museums must remember their continuum, I believe, and work with that. I'm saying that as a museum like the Met, but is 152 years old. Um, but I do think that museums, uh, by their bearing and the work they do, can create platforms for conversation. I think they can, play, can create a lot of platforms. Again, I agree with Glenn, I don't know how you measure the result of that, but you can create platforms. And um, you know, I do believe that museums can do and must do very, very important things. They have to help frame conversations. They have to put language and engage in the definition of language in ways that have some utility. Um, they can certainly invite new voices into the public square, and they must do that. And I believe the three large institutions that share uh, this panel um, are doing just that. Um, and I think importantly, and uh, uh, irrevocably, we have to put artists at the center of that conversation. If we're gonna make sustained change, it's gonna be because artists in the, in the midst of that conversation create that new way of understanding. Um, we have to accept diverse thinking. We have to accept conflict. We have to 
negotiate different points of view into our institutions and work with those as best we can. And here I might just put out one small quibble with Alan's uh, framing remarks, just so maybe uh, we can come back to it. Um, I, I agree that evidence and science trump uh, dogma and supposition, uh, but in the middle, beyond uh, simply evidence and science is imagination. And I think if museums aren't talking about imagination, which is in between your two poles, then you're not releasing into creativity, innovation, new ways of doing things, the true um, the voice of the artist in your institution. So I want to leave that thought out there, say that at the moment we have an extraordinary exhibition up at the MFA called Fabric of a Nation, American Quilt Stories. And uh, it does tell an alternative history of America through the act of making quilts. And I, I've been thinking a lot about quilts because quilts are about connectivity and about collage. And they're about the way in which different voices come together. Remember, many quilts are made by multiple makers. And there's something that is resonant for me in thinking about the MFA. I don't know how that's gonna play its way through, but it does allow that notion of new voices to come into your institution when you think of your institution in that way. Anyway, more to say, but happy to be, very happy to be here. Well, we appreciate that. Thank you so much. And um, Nicola, I'd like to just switch the question a little bit. And I want to thank you both Glenn and Matthew for tackling that second question where we're looking at can institutions, prestigious art institutions, better create change and new will that result in less racial injustice, economic inequality, and poverty? And can that impact be measured? which is you know, a very, I think, intriguing question. How would you measure that? How do you measure that is, is very interesting. I think the other thing that comes to mind, many look at some of the larger institutions and say, you know, there is tax dollar support for those institutions. So that is the black working class bus driver, the Hispanic grocery store worker. And are these museums you know, serving the interests of that aspect of the community as well. So that's just something to think about as we move forward. But Nicole, Nicola, rather than just looking at the museums, can you talk a little bit as an independent gallery owner about that thought and the answer to that question? Well, thank you. Thank you so much to the Eisenhower Foundation and to my esteemed uh, panelists here. It's really wonderful to be amongst you, all of you giant minds, and uh, thank you for uh, having my perspective on the table. Uh, this convening is such an important conversation, and it's terrific to sit here because I would say across the span of my professional life in art, these questions have always been at the fore of my mind. As a gallery open uh, owner and one who recently opened, I'm interested in really the role of education and how it can help tackle the concerns on the table. When I was building the gallery prospectus, it was very important that a system of community engagement be firmly rooted in our outlook. I mean, if you don't learn, you can't try, you can't understand and you can't do better. So I was, um, you know, really astounded when reading the New York Times editorial that was that's the update of the Kerner Commission to learn that the cultural capital of the world, New York City, is also the most educationally segregated state in America. That is truly astonishing. How is it possible that our home, our city, one of the most engaging and for informationally rich places in the world allows many of its citizens to be so malnourished in terms of knowledge and exposure. So I've been thinking a lot about how the gallery can, or other entities, of course, the museum um, is a very specific model, but how uh, smaller entities can engage. And I've been thinking a lot about how the gallery, the museum can become an alternative site for education in deeper and richer ways. Um, 
specifically with the gallery, I'm, I'm thinking about two lines of, of, of programming, internal and external. Um, you know, I think it's very important that when one engages artists and storytelling, that they offer a sense of history, a sense of the present and a sense of the future. But most ex importantly, through the prism of a lived experience. So uh, people can readily identify with ideas because they reflect something that people are living through or understand regardless of who they are or where, where they come from, right? Race, gender. Um, so I'm interested in layering conversations to tackle historical and contemporary art, of course, but also social condition. Um, how do we assemble artists of all creeds and ages and color to highlight uh, not only the lived experience, but the shared experience? So uh, that is one part of our programmatic plan. Uh, on the other hand, there is the idea of external programming, how one can, you know, operate in engagement with the exterior community. How can we do things like after school programs for junior and high school students? Um, so we're looking at alternative uh, schools with low performing students uh, who can come in and learn uh, about the history and future of art. So um, I'm interested in a coalition of educators, of other galleries and uh, mentors, artists to facilitate these conversations. Thank you so much, Nicola. And Daniel, um, if you can answer perhaps both of those questions, I mean, should MoMA, the Met, Boston Museum of Fine Arts and other institutions, prestigious, prestigious art institutions, adopt the same position that the Smithsonian did? And then the second question, about how can they, if they can, contribute to the development of a new will to reduce racial inequality, racial injustice, and poverty? And can it be measured? Thank you very much for the opportunity to join this panel and to have a chance to think together with all of you on these very interesting and challenging issues. Uh, it should not be surprising that I, I fully agree with the comments that Glenn and Matthew have already made about museums. I think we would all say that the events of the last year and a half, two years, have led in fundamental ways to the most profound period of change in the life of our institutions, maybe ever. And the question then is, why did that happen? What does it mean? What should the scope of that ambition be? And what is likely to happen in the future in a way of responding to the questions that you have presented with us? So I would start by saying it isn't our job, nor is it are we capable of changing the world. We don't have the, the capacity to do that. We can't make people think one way or the other. We are, however, extraordinarily important places for ideas to live and to be a, we are in fact a social experiment of enormous effectiveness in our communities. That the museum movement in this country has led to something absolutely extraordinary in the ways in which we can come together, ideally learn ways to bridge difference, build community and learn from each other. And imagine for a moment if there weren't museums, where would we go? How would we actually, what kind of places are there in our society for people to come together in this kind of way to learn from each other, to be inspired, to have shared experiences that foster the fabric of democracy, ultimately is what is what we do. But we can't make people do anything. And, um, and so I would say within the context of what the Smithsonian has announced they would do, we can make very substantial changes within our institutions that have a cascading effect on those who connect with us, either directly and steadfastly, the people who love museums who come all the time, people who wander through in other ways or people who read about our work in the media or other ways. So there are extraordinary ways in which we can affect what people believe, what values they hold, what regard they place for, other, for others. But we can't make them do that. We can only be an, a source of inspiration and learning. And beyond that, I think it's very important for us, and I'll be more specific in just one moment. Um, I think it's very important for us to live within our mission. 
I agree with Matthew, we have a profound obligation to our society, but we are not fundamentally built for social justice and we are not activist organizations by definition. We are perpetual organizations. Our job is to be here forever. Our job is to support the development of our institution on an evolutionary path towards ever being a better reflection of the vision we give to it in perpetuity so that successive generations have a better museum than the ones we inherited. And this is the work we're doing now. It's a perpetual experiment, but we must live within our mission, which is around art, education, scholarship. We shouldn't be engaging in issues that are beyond our purview or competence. That isn't what we, what we, if we do those things, we begin to lose, I think, the capacity to maintain trust with all of the public who engage with us and to help, uh, help them on the path that we are competent to do. So how do we do that? First of all, I think what the Smithsonian said sounded to me like an extraordinarily ambitious articulation of what they'd like to do, but it's not exactly clear how they're gonna do that. We'll wait to see. I think we can lead meaningful change and progress within our mission by making sure we think in a pragmatic way about who leads our institutions, who serves on our boards, who holds administrative roles. If you can find ways in which mechanisms that genuinely allow that representation to be consistent with the larger world that brings the breadth of perspectives, experiences and expertise, then the decision makers, people building the program are gonna be reflective of the world around us. That's fundamental. And everybody in this virtual room is doing that. Who leads? What stories do we tell? What collections do we build? We are all working on ways of expanding that. It is an extraordinary presumption to call the Metropolitan an, ex an encyclopedic museum. We, th we, we aspire to collect the work of all civilizations across five millennia, but in fact, we only collect a small percentage of those. We are, in, I would use the term universalist in the sense that we seek to find connections across difference and we are ever expanding the things that we collect. But we have to be humble in our own assertion of what it is that we do. But expanding that as part of what we're doing, more diverse stories, more diverse collections, um, all of that is part of what you can do to approximate what the Smithsonian is doing. Who gets to tell those stories? How do we engage the audiences we seek to reach? Most of the people we really want to reach to bring deep change aren't coming up the steps of the Met every day. These are people who are intimidated by the institution. They're not even sure what the place represents. We have to find ways to meet people where they are, bring them in and give them a joyful experience that allows them to want to be transformed, not to hector them or lecture them or tell them what the ways in which they need to be different. Because that typically doesn't work in a learning environment. We have to reach them where they are, bring them to us, build community, foster greater understanding, and that is the work of generations. So we can start now, and I'll finish here, what has happened over the last two years, that we have jump-started and recognizing what Alan has been talking about. We have, in many ways, failed as a society. There is a disgraceful history in this country around issues of race, and we know we need to face it. And what has followed after the horrible murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others has been an acceleration of that progress of change. Our goal should be to find a way to sustain the momentum of meaningful change so that over time, year over year and across generations, that work continues because we will not get there next year or the year after that. This is a long-term process. But what we can do is use this as a milestone moment. We've done that at the Met, and we can talk later about how we've done that. I know that, that both Glenn and Matthew have done that as well. So our legacy will be when we leave these roles, the place is different than we found it, and it's on a trajectory to continue to evolve. And that's the best I think we can hope for. I'll finish where Glenn started. We can be a catalyst in a crucible, but we can't change the world. We can change our place and the people we touch, and let's hope that has a an effect over time that is meaningful. 
Thank you so much, Daniel, and I really appreciate that you also tackled that second question of diverse audiences. How do we reach diverse audiences? And I think after we hear from Hank and Rasu, we can delve a little deeper into some of the questions that you raised, because as you said, the stories that you tell, the art that you curate, the exhibitions are in fact a part of creating a certain a certain into a certain intellect a certain vision a certain you know sense of life and perspective towards the world and there's a saying that you can't stay still on a moving train so in a sense museums are activists you might not want to be considered activists but in, indeed you are because when you go through those hallowed halls and you look at that art and you look at the story that's being told and you look at the art that's being curated and the voices that are being seen as you as you I think as you addressed you do it's a certain it's a it's a particular story that you work away walk away with a history an understanding an insight a perspective so I think that after we hear from Hank and Rasu, maybe we can delve a little deeper into those questions. So Hank, love to get your thoughts about all of this. Oh, darn. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that. I love what you have in the background. That is, that is really intriguing right now. <laughs> oh, cool. Thank you. Well, I first um, have to say thank you so much, Alan and Leela for having me and also having all of us. This is definitely one of the most exciting uh, panels I've ever been on with so many people who have been influential in my work, in my life, in my career. And I am just uh, grateful for the context of this conversation. Um, I must be transparent that I am a member of MoMA's uh, trustee committee on education and um, have considered myself a friend of Glenn and his daughter, Alexis, who curated an exhibition of mine, uh, of my work, I think six or seven years ago. So I'm biased. <laughs> um, Pamela Joyner has been, I think, one of the most game-changing art collectors in uh, this century. And uh, Nicola has been one of my biggest advocates and supporters and has also been an incredible game-changer through her uh, consulting and uh, mentoring of artists. Um, I have to say that I fundamentally disagree with the three museum directors though. <laughs> um, and I have to start with the background of my mother's MoMA uh, membership card in 1979. I know for a fact, if it weren't for that uh, acceptance and the education that she got as a young African-American woman uh, artist, uh, that I wouldn't be here. And <laughs> by default, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> um, my mother was, uh, her name is Ebra Willis. She's a curator, art historian who worked at Schomburg Center for Researching Art and Black Culture uh, for uh, two, almost two decades, uh, after which she worked at what was then called the African American Museum Project at the Smithsonian, which we now refer to as the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And so I grew up actually in these institutions, um, actually in the archives, understanding uh, the power of art to change and shape society. And I believe that all art is political. I don't believe it has to look political to be political. Ellsworth Kelly uh, is a political artist in my, in, in my position, in, um, for my position. Uh, but I also had experiences at, uh, at, the, at the Met uh, where there was Kerry James Marshall's mastery exhibition, which uh, was groundbreaking and I would say earth shattering for the art for the art world, but also especially the art market, which is highly political. When a black artist who's living can sell a painting for over twenty million dollars, that does reshape the way in which we understand the value of images of black people and the work of black artists. 
uh, at the Museum of Fine Art uh, Boston, I got the privilege of seeing an exhibition by Gordon Parks called uh, Back to Fort Scott, which was a very small but really profound exhibition for me where I began to understand a different element of artists who I greatly respect's work. Um, and uh, of course, there's the, the Whitney's Black Male exhibition, which was curated by Thelma Golden, which uh, was highly controversial at the time, but I think paved the way for so much of the work we see today. Um, and when it comes bringing it back to MoMA, I, I had the privilege with my collaboration for Freedoms in, uh, when was that? In 2017, in 2016, we put up this billboard in Mississippi that said, make America great again. And it featured uh, Spider Martin's photograph of, of John Lewis uh, and Josiah Williams and many civil, nonviolent civil rights activists. And we had the privilege of actually exhibiting that physical billboard in MoMA PS1. And in speaking to like just a few months later uh, in, in collaborating with the community to actually have discourse about the current moment of change that was happening there. Uh, and one of the things that I learned in that experience was the way in which MoMA proselytized for modern art through, under the leadership of Alfred Barr um, and sending out and loaning out exhibitions to you know Grand Rapids, Missouri and Lawrence, Kansas um, and all of these museums that learned about what we now consider the canon of modern art through the activism and uh, I would say in the um, um, evangelism of uh, New York curators. We also were able to put a billboard outside of the MFA Boston that said, "Make a, uh, where do we go from here? Quoting the words of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, who said in his final speech, uh, where do we go from here, uh, chaos or community? Uh, these are places that I find very important. As at Four Freedoms, uh, we believe that uh, there is an incredible nexus between art, education, commerce, and politics uh, that is always in, at play because the people who have the uh, income to influence politics also have the income to influence and shape art. Uh, and a lot of that comes through their relationship to commerce. Um, uh, and so, and, and education, of course. And so I believe that not only are the museums catalysts and crucibles, uh, I believe that they do change the world. I believe that you all are incredibly powerful people. And I just gave you just a few examples, a way in which I think that work that has happened under your tenure has changed the lives of several million people. Uh, I can't tell you what it was like for me as a young black man growing up in the Upper West Side of New York, going to the, to, to the Met and seeing virtually no images in the 1980s of African-Americans. Um, and there's one problem I still have with the Met, which is that Egypt is not considered part of Africa. We can talk about that later. <laughs> but that is to be an activist position uh, that in the way that art, is, it, it, art history is told, we don't actually create a continuity between the work that took place in Africa 2,000, 5,000 years ago and what's happening today. And so I think that um, that is, and I think it's also true and I agree, I see, I agree with all of what you said. <laughs> I just disagree with what you think is the responsibility. I, I, I believe that, that, that the, the ambitious mission of sustaining meaningful change uh, in museums, uh, which you all have overseen over the past several years is uh, a profound permanent and perpetual uh, goal, which should be at the core of any political agenda. Uh, and I know this is like the best time to be a white man running a museum, <laughs> but, <laughs> but and, and so um, I just wanna say that I acknowledge that you all have kind of done so much prior to the heat. And I'm sure that now that the heat is on that you're also thinking more. So thank you all for your work, thank you uh, everyone for having me and thank you for your work, Rasu. And so Layla, Layla, if I could jump in, this is why you shouldn't listen to museum directors ever. <laughs> Just listen to great artists. You'll learn a lot more and their message will carry. We can pick up some of the things that Hank uh, was saying, but that's why museums are platforms for artists. 
Yeah, that's very profound. And and I want to dive into some of the things that uh, Hank raised, which I think are so important and so compelling. But let's first hear from Rasu Jelani, who did address this question as well. He's unfortunately not with us in person, but he pre-recorded his remarks. So the question here is, what are some imaginative or creative ways that well-resourced institutions um, can deploy art strategically um, to create or inspire change and the will. I think, and I've been really um, consistent here, right? That art cannot inspire change within itself. It needs to be connected directly or in concert with an ongoing practice and movement in order to tap into the live and living consciousness of culture that is ever evolving and emerging, right? So we also have to admit that Sometimes once art is exhibited, it's often outdated from the moment it's referenced, from the moment it's referencing, right? Um, This is where social practice and community engagement projects have been able to um, be elevated and and move towards relevance because it's live with the movement, you know? It's like you take a photo and the moment of that photo has already passed when you put it up on the wall and that's kind of how it operates. Um, movement building is always evolving, always emerging, and it, it needs to be tapped in and res- it needs more resources. So how can we use the resources of these bigger institutions to tap in and create a bigger ecosystem that was all hands on decks, it's all resource on decks. Um, that way we can have a cohesive movement um, that is both art, that is on the street level, grassroots level, and is also politically. Um, adjacent as well, right? How can we get um, into the litigation um, process as well by using art and by using using movement building? Um, so I do want to big up um, one of our esteemed uh, panelists who represents a museum here, but the Met has the uh, the Civic Practice Partnership, which was launched a few years ago, and um, it catalyzes and implements creative projects that enhance healthy communities by bringing skills and interests of neighborhood stakeholders together um, of those of the Mets and artists who are socially um, socially minded in their practice. So some of my friends are on this um, in this in this cohort or this fellowship. You have Rashida Bumbre, you have Toshi Regan, you have John Gray. Um, May Loom and uh, Miguel Luciano. So let's highlight Miguel Luciano for a second, right? So Miguel Luciano is working on this project um, and this project has multiple prongs. He has the El Met, he has Semi Libre. Um, he's also elevating his ongoing practice and elevating and paying homage to the community of East um, Harlem, which is a Latino based community. Um, he had the, the block party of uh, Semi Libre. Um, he also um, served as a three-year re- residency with the Met. This is where you have movement, we have socially engaged artists, and a big institution all connected at the same time, right? And and also acknowledging the community that is adjacent to. So I think there's there's opportunities to do things like this more often, and also celebrate the the artists who are sacrificing. Um, maybe making millions of dollars in, in, in art exhibiting, but really being in community and doing it a little differently. And not everyone has to do the same thing, but I think there's an opportunity to celebrate more of these artists who are working in a very um, complex and cohesive way. Um, I also want to big up from my hometown of Queens, the Queens Museum, which has a long standing history of engaging their community at large in the arts and social and, and, social and cultural programs while attuning to the needs and the local issues of Queens, right? Now, it doesn't reach all of Queens. We can't make that assertion, but the fact that it has a robust outreach mechanism. And then lastly, Laundromat Project, which is um, I'm on the board of. And what we do is we're always looking at how we can be better uh, a resource for the artists in our communities and the neighborhoods that we that we exist in. More recently, we've... Um, we looked at community engagement as a cultural strategy. This is evolving, this is new, but we're looking at less as an initiative or a program, but as a cultural strategy. How can community engagement be a cultural strategy? How can we get more stakeholders in the community connected to um, our mission and our mission connected to the community, which creates our authenticity, which creates more emergence and it creates more opportunities for us to grow, right? Um, so th- that's my answer, and hopefully 
Um, I've been coherent and hopefully um, y'all with me on this on this journey. And I give thanks again to the Eisenhower Foundation um, for allowing me to assert some of my ideas here. And look, I got really heated. I took off my glasses. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I thank you all and I thank my panelists. Um, I look forward to hearing how all these ideas come together. Let's dive into some of the things I think that Hank raised. Thank you so much for, for advancing the conversation in the way that you did. Um, I mean, you said that all art is political. You said that art has power. And that if you look at the money behind some of the well-resourced art institutions, there, there is certainly a responsibility. And as I had mentioned, you know, art museums, like many organizations, are tax exempt. So to some extent are supported by the working class, black bus driver, and, and so on. And you talked about art being a catalytic crucible. Um, so I'm, I'm, I would love to get some thoughts from everyone about those concepts that you raised so profoundly, Hank. Can I comment on that very briefly? Yes, every, I think everyone, it would be great to have everyone, I mean, whoever would like to share their thoughts, absolutely. Yes, I, I Daniel. think what Hank said resonates with all of us, and I actually agree with you. I, I think actually the impact you're describing is very heartening to hear because that's what we're, we're, we're working to do. When we decided to have the exhibition of Kerry James Marshall, that was a decision we took in order to give him the platform he deserves. So I suppose one could characterize that as a political decision. But I think of it as the distinction I would make, and I'll say this briefly, is that I think our focus should be on the work. It should be on the storytelling, the narratives, the scholarship, the artists, and not on the political activist questions. Artists can do that for sure. Almost everything we display has political content, but our mission as museums is not to traffic in political content. It's to engage in meaningful art that can, can inspire and educate people. And that's the, I think that's the difference I, I, how I would characterize what we do. It is un, inevitably political in consequence and in narrative, but that isn't our a priori goal. It's to engage the art and the artists and the work. So I'll, I'll add a layer into that. I do think it's generational. For sure, our generation, and I think Matthew, Dan, and I are all roughly uh, of the same generation and probably had very similar educational backgrounds. For our generation, there is this belief that museums are platforms for artists, that they can be catalytic in their connection to communities, that they have a responsibility to be open, welcoming, generous, that they are designed in a way to communicate deeply held ideas by artists, to stimulate the imagination and to create conversation. But there's also a belief that we are not activist organizations, that, that, that we gain our credibility by our ability to be platforms for all. It's very clear that the generation that is now really engaged at the beginning of their careers with museums feels fundamentally different and believes that museums should have an activist role. And I think the, there will be a kind of renegotiation over the next decade between the generation that will be exiting institutions and the generation that will be leading them. Uh, and the, 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 the opportunity is perhaps to see museums become far more activists in their, not just in, in the uh, work they seek to uh, 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 present to the public, but activists in their programs to target, to use, I think, the kind of thinking Alan was talking about, to target these systemic issues. And uh, that's where I think the change will come. But I, 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 I find it, I, I, am, I am troubled by what that activism as an explicit dimension of museum practice produces as opposed to seeking to enable communities from every possible walk of life to find meaning within the museum. Now, let me um, pose a question to you, though. 
Is it not activist? Hank talked about when he was younger going into the museum and not seeing himself reflected. Isn't that a, a form of activism? So you all are doing these, um, this amazing work in expanding what is seen in the museum and expanding the artist voices that are being heard. But wasn't it activist back then if voices of color, artists of color were excluded? Wasn't it activist back then if only one kind of history was shown? Um, as Hank was saying, isn't it activist if Egypt is not considered part of Africa? Are those reflections of activism or not? I'm not sure I would use the language activist. Those are deliberate decisions that confine the world of knowledge and access in ways that has consequences. Um, and I think museums are, as I said before, I think we are perpetual institutions embarked on a journey of perpetual change. We have, for example, now a wonderful exhibition on Native American art. But that's a category. And, and 25 years from now, that's probably 15 different exhibitions of different nations and communities who will say, what the hell were you putting all of us together for? We have very different histories and different stories to tell. And grouping us all together is, is a way of, of actually doing a disservice to difference. As our knowledge expands, as our recognition of the depth and richness of our community expands, as our insight into what it takes to function as a real true society that is conclusive expands, our collections and our scholarship will expand. And I think what Hank is describing was a very limited point of view that reflected, if you were to have asked the Met in those days, are you an encyclopedic place? They'd say, absolutely. When the museum was founded 150 years ago, they thought it was encyclopedic because it had the art of Northern Europe and Southern Europe. And that's it. So I think um, the journey we're on is, is one of modesty and recognition that we need to continue to learn. But I'm not sure that's activism exactly. That's, that's, um, that's core to the institution's mission of scholarship. Yeah, maybe I could just, okay, no, go ahead. So we've got um, Hank and Matthew, and I'd love to hear from you as well, Pamela, as a activist collector. <laughs> I have always bristled at the term activism because I don't like the people I see on TV that when I think that, that define themselves as activists because it, there's an assumption that they know something the way that it's presented. And I believe that with those four freedoms, we've always said that good art asks questions and good design answers them. And that when art stops asking questions, it becomes propaganda. And I think there is, I can understand the hesitance and the discomfort with the term activism. And I think perhaps we could be, do a service to actually kind of un articulate more what we mean when we say that. I'm using it in the general sense that like to live is to act, <laughs> to create is to act. So everything is an action and that makes everyone an activist. That's, so that's a very, fundamental <laughs> art argument. Uh, I also did want to say uh, briefly about the measurable elements of it. I, I know for a fact, because I'm also on the board of uh, the Public Art Fund and Crystal Bridges um, the Museum in Arkansas, that you can measure the impact of the work that you've done through the diversity of the audiences, through the diversity in the collection. Um, and the fact that when I walked through the new MoMA uh, collection when you were open, I, there wasn't the token black artist. There was a whole, even a whole room dedicated to Carrie Mae Weems' uh, controversial images of, uh, of um, around uh, enslaved figures who are in the collection of of Harvard. So I'm like, I see it everywhere in every way, but I do empathize with the uh, icky feeling of being called an activist. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, <laughs> thank you, Hank. Um, I guess I want to say something about representation in museums and pick up on what Hank was saying earlier and is reinforcing now this notion of seeing yourself allows you to be there. And um, what I do think the generational shift is, and certainly it's a shift in my thinking the longer I'm in the profession, is the notion of a commitment to building audience. And I actually think the most important thing museums build is audience. And the New York Museum directors won't share my hunger for more people because they have too many people in their museums. 
But in these small little places like Boston, we hunger not only for quantity, which is to say, let's get more people in so that there's a mission uh, that is fulfilled, but also the diversity of learning styles, of representation of audiences, communities, neighborhoods, the notion that when you build an audience, you also build, I'm gonna say it, a quilt of different ideas. You build new inputs that can create a truly reciprocal relationship between an institution and its community. And I do think that is a shift generationally. And it, maybe it starts getting a little activist in quotes, when you think about the strategies some of my younger colleagues want to use to attract those audiences, but I'm listening very carefully because if the end result is that our audiences reflect our communities around us more strongly, allow people to feel they can make meaning in our institutions, then that's an activist streak I want to listen to really carefully. Thank you, Matthew. Pamela. So maybe uh, sort of describing myself as an activist collector is a sloppy descriptor. Because the other thing I say and did say, I believe, is that we are mission driven. And the mission is to do everything we can to insert the voices of artists of color who were omitted arbitrarily from the narrative and from the canon. It's a really specific focus. Um, you know, we we engage in the act of doing that, um, but but we're focused on on the mission. Um, and sort of apropos to what a lot of people have said, I you know I just want to reflect on some things that um, you know have been said all you know have been, have been said by others already. So uh, Hank, um, you know my experience with museums is not unlike how you describe yours, and not not unlike how you describe your mom's. I grew up uh, in Chicago, between the age of memory four or five years old, and the time I went away to college at age 16, there probably was not a week where I was not in a museum and particularly the Art Institute of Chicago. So museums have had a profound effect on my psyche, on my life, on my soul and my view of myself. Um, and so, but I shared the experience, Hank, that you had as a, as a young person, you're much younger than I am, when you went to museums and didn't and didn't see yourself, and so um, I think this this idea of accessibility and so I, you know, in a way I'm really fortunate because when I was growing up in Chicago, museums were free, so all I had to do is walk across the street and go to the museum, but but access is one issue, and welcoming is another, and so. I think we all can do more to welcome people into the museum and reach out, uh, as was mentioned earlier, to meet people where they live. And to Alan's early point, when we do that, we know that works. So um, I remember going to see Mastery several times. I think I went four or five times to the Met to see that show and the line snaked around the building. Um, another show that was, is near and dear to my heart um, was um, Soul of a Nation, which turned into the show that never ended, right? It, it was supposed to be at Tate. It had a hard time touring. It came to the States and it never stopped touring, in part because I think communities are hungering for seeing themselves. Uh, and then one of the best examples I can think of, of course, I'm biased, is a half a dozen years ago, um, the MoMA did a, uh, you know, a, a monumental exhibition of Jake Lawrence's migration series, which is not an unfamiliar series uh, in, tr in the traditional museum context. What was unusual is that for me, the experience of that show was almost as vibrant, if not even more vibrant, online and much more accessible to a very wide audience than going into the physical building to see the work. And so 
you know, those are just a few observations in, in, in relation to the discussion. So that's really interesting also that you raise some of the innovative techniques of bringing art to communities and to people and, and art that tells a very important narrative that may have been left out heretofore. So thank you so much for that. So, so moving on, we, we were talking, I think we were engaged in a very important discussion about how art museums, prestigious art museums, are changing and transforming to meet these new times, to embrace diversity, to tell different narratives. So I'd love to get some of your thoughts on that. I'm going to ask Nicola a question, if I can, because I'm really interested in uh, hearing what you need from museums. I'm curious what you need. Like, what are you looking for? What are you hungry for us to do? Well, what a great question. And uh, thank you for asking it. Because uh, as I'm listening to everyone speak, it really highlights and affirms to me that this is no less a task than really looking at the entire expanse of history and how we reconsider it, and therefore how we consider the future. And having had quite monolithic uh, viewpoints shows us that there's a great deal of work to do. And within that scope of work, one sees that there is a greater rate of change happening that the generation afoot is demanding. So it feels like a compounding and a compounding and a compounding of work. However, I think at the bottom of all this, it's very, very simple. People want to communicate with each other. They want to be able to feel, as Pamela said, welcome in spaces. They want to feel educated, but I think almost in poetic ways, you know? I, there's so much uh, militant and hardcore information and movement and thought around that I think our art sites are, are places of imaginative and poetic engagement. And how do we tell stories in really nuanced ways, but that feel uh, like a thread running through everyone's lives? Um, so I'm really interested in stories that acknowledge that I am like you and like everyone else on this panel in really deep, expansive ways. Let Caspar David Friedrich tell me that story. Let Jacob Lawrence tell me that story. Let Tishan tell me the story. Let, you know, Hank Willis tell me that story. I'm really interested in the concerns that art history, the present of art and future of art links together and makes us feel whole and human. Thoughts on that? Any thoughts on that from others? Thank you, Nicola. And I think we have about 10 minutes left. Um, and of course, we want to take questions from the audience as well. They can, they can just put them in chat. But I was going to go around and just get some closing reflections and, and thoughts from people on this. And um, some of you have laid out some very important challenges for, for particularly museums and others, and um, maybe sharing some thoughts on that as well. Um, why don't we start with you, Alan? I think, I think the, the most important reality from this marvelous dialogue is the careful, thoughtful, but initial discussion over activism in these institutions. That to me, as someone who is trying to create change on outcomes like race and inequality is so crucial. And this, this, this thinking, this wisdom tonight really helps us as we try to sift through all these suggestions and lessons learned and get back to the Mellon Foundation on what the future ought to be. So my comment simply is to, uh, to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for your wisdom. <laughs> thank you, Alan. Uh, Pamela. So, um, you know, I started optimistic and I end on a note of optimism. Um, you know, I'm especially inspired by, you know, museums, 
museum directors, gallerists, and artists doing the hard work of change. It requires elbow grease, thought, and persistence. And uh, in order to get to a place of sustainability, uh, which I think all of us have um, uh, endorsed as a concept. So um, I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> Thank you, Pamela. And moving alphabetically, Glenn. So I want to uh, return to Jack Whitten and a topolis for Edouard Glissant. Uh, we are at the end of the day uh, about artists. Uh, we're not about museums, we're about artists. Museums exist, art museums exist because artists create work. Uh, and I think when we foreground our efforts in the work of artists uh, and can reflect the richness and diversity of all of our communities in the art we show, the art we collect, and in the programs we create, uh, we can create the welcome that would allow a young Hank uh, Willis Thomas and his extraordinary mother, his extraordinary mother, uh, to find themselves in the museum in a different way than they did 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, they may not, uh, I, one has to say, whatever Hank found turn, turned him into an extraordinary artist. But I take very seriously what it would mean to come into a museum and be welcomed by seeing art by people you recognize uh, and who can speak to you in a language that is powerful and meaningful. So I come back to Atopolis. How do all those thousands of little tesserae that make up this extraordinary painting combine and recombine to create the networks that allow us as human beings to work together? to find those common threads that actually build culture. And I think Jack, who is a remarkable artist, who understood the sting of racism and the sting of exclusion, but continued to make art that moves us profoundly, and who, at the end of his life, got to see the recognition that he was due 40 years earlier. When I look at Atopolis, I see it both as a as a metaphor for how community is built, but also as a symbol of what we have to work to ensure we do better at. Thank you so much, Glenn. And then moving on to Matthew. First of all, I need to express a real uh, thanks to Alan. And I, I don't know if I can speak for Glenn and Dan, but for a museum director today to be called wise, is like the big greatest thrill of my day. I just want to say, like, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that and quote it many times. Alan, you've given me a great gift. Uh, my kids don't call me wise. My staff don't call me wise, and I'm having a, a bit of a crisis. So you've given me a real. But your wife <laughs> does. Yes, that's true. Okay, yeah, right. I guess she does. Um, you know, here, here's, I, I'm, I'm stuck on a little, a little thing, which I think is a big thing which is what Hank said about uh, Egypt as part of Africa. And um, the reason I'm stuck on it is as soon as you said that, Hank, I thought museums organize knowledge. They do it through their displays and through their categories. And you're questioning that, no that categor categorization and by the way, I think you're right. But that's what we have to disrupt are the ways we organize knowledge. And it's really tough, which is a compliment to Glenn, whose reinstallation of the MoMA, which I know you didn't do all by yourself, Glenn. I know you had a whole team, but I know it was really important to you. And you showed us that there was a way to organize knowledge differently. And when that reorganization can create invitation, welcome, and deep engagement, there's something really special that happens. And um, I think about that a lot, that if museums do organize knowledge, what inputs do we need to create a different DNA of that organization? 
So Hank, that's something I'm going to think about. I mean, we're deep in that conversation at the, at, in Boston. Um, and in the end, it's both a, a categorical approach, it's a physical approach. And I think what you're saying, uh, it's also a relationship to audience. And I think that's a really important thing to remember. Thank you so much for those profound reflections. Um, Nicola. Nicola, <laughs> I want to make sure I'm saying your name right. It's so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what a fascinating and enriching conversation. Thanks again to you all. Um, you know, as you describe this idea of recategorizing knowledge, it really signifies to me that that new frontier, if it can be transmitted to the least among us, then we will be the best of ourselves. How do we reach to people, reach out, have conversations, educate those who truly have no access, truly would never be welcome. And then I think we're doing the darkest, deepest work. How can we use our platforms, educational, reaching out into the schools? How, you know, education I really think is the key and how do all the resources that, that uh, come together in, with institutional force uh, touch the least among us, because then together, I think the tide will rise and send us into very progressive uh, horizons. Thank you. Daniel. Well, I would say that I, I, overall, I'm very, this has been a, a wonderful conversation. I'm very encouraged by the progress that I think museums can make in building the institutions that are more closely approximate what the vision you're describing. I am far less sanguine about the world around us, and I, I will see what happens. But within the museum community, uh, first of all, Hank, I have good news. We have a, a very significant exhibition opening in a few months on Egyptian art as part of the African world. That's exactly <laughs> what it's directed to do. And that happened because we are beginning to challenge the ways we organize knowledge. And under Max Holine, our director, he asked our curatorial departments to talk to each other more and find ways to tell stories that show these, that these communities are connected. And that exhibition came out of that idea. That said, we can do these incremental things that challenge boundaries of knowledge. But we also need to acknowledge, and I'll, I'll finish here, that the evolution of the structures that create knowledge need to continue to move along better than at a glacial pace. We would all agree 100% with certainty that 50 years from now, the curatorial departments that define our institutions will no longer exist. They'll be completely different. But we don't really have any idea how we're gonna get there because we have to live in that moment. But we know that's work we're embarked on because the way we create structures defines the way we do work and how we think about generating knowledge. That has to evolve as institutions evolve, as collections evolve as representation and leadership evolves, we are working towards a better version of the institutions we live in today by taking these steps one day at a time. Thank you so much, Matthew. And I think it's really appropriate, Hank, that you have the last word. <laughs> Never appropriate. <laughs> um, uh, well, I, I wanna say thank you all for, for um, everything that you have done and will do in this space. Um, I hope that we all make our uh, sisters and brothers, nieces and nephews uh, and uh, children and great grandchildren happy and proud with the work that we do um, because we will live on um, and the people who are impacted by our thoughts, actions and deeds. Um, I wanted to leave with a quote um, by um, Eisenhower, President Eisenhower in his inaugural address where he says, whatever America hopes to bring to pass in the world must first come to pass in the heart of America. That could be a metaphor for each and every one of us or each and every one of your museums, your galleries, your collections, your foundations, uh, that whatever we want to happen in the world must first happen inside of us. And I wanna, point out that art does not have its skin color. It's more than just about people of color seeing themselves in images. It's about other people who don't identify um, with the artist who no one can look at Jack Witten and tell his skin color. So it's a wonder how his work didn't make it into the museum. 
<laughs> so what what's really profound for us to really think about is how we can get past the blinders of race, class, gender to see the human being in the work and to be conscious of the human beings that we're not inviting and including into the discourse uh, because of our um, myopia. Um, and also I want to point out that every artist is in a, in a sense, much like every activist, a, a, a shaman or a psychic um, because, and every curator as well, museum director, we're all living in the future. Everything you're doing will be touched, affected, and um, admired or despised <laughs> by people who are going to be um, experiencing what we do 50 years from now. So that is, when that was most profound for me, when I saw Jack Witten's exhibition at uh, Hauser and Worth in 2014, and saw paintings on display for the first time in 50 years that he had not sold. So trying to imagine what it was like for him to, for 50 years, keep paintings that were undeniably exquisite when the world did not know or acknowledge that. Um, he saw that far ahead. And I hope that we can um, embrace that awareness that it's, I believe is in each and every one of us in the work that we do. And um, lastly, I, I, when I, Matthew, I'm, I'm working on the uh, uh, Embrace sculpture for uh, the Boston Common. And I was thinking about what it was like for a young Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King to be walking through Boston as young lovers um, and going to the museums. Um, and if you can't, if you don't think that the work that they saw on the walls there did create the ripple of hope that we're all living in, I challenge you <laughs> to reconsider.